so I don't have a PowerPoint, although there is one particular image that I would have liked to share with you. I'll, I'll let you know uh, which one that is. Um, also, uh, I'm glad that I came after uh, my colleagues who presented quite uh, grounded um, uh, examples of their, of their work, uh, whether in Brazil or in London. Um, what I talk to you, um, um, what I want to do today is a bit perhaps more abstract, so I'm going to try to see if I can keep you awake and not dying of hunger. Um, so uh, basically what I want, what I want to focus on um, is on specifically three things today. The first thing that I want to, to do is to make a case for thinking about uh, disorder, not order. Uh, as we have been asked to do. Um, uh, and I want us to think about disorder as the key feature of city life and urban futures. Uh, and, and this is because if you, if you really think about it, the, the policy impetus uh, for the orderly city comes not from a situation of order itself, uh, but from the perceptions we have about what is disorderly in city life and urban environments. And, and about uh, what forms uh, or degrees of disorder um, are acceptable uh, to us individually or as groups. So that, that would be the first thing. The second thing that I would like to do is to propose that in, in thinking about this, this focus on disorder implies a different way of thinking about normative values uh, and the universal principles for uh, guiding urban action. Um, urban policies tend to focus on predefining almost ontologically uh, the principles for what counts as the orderly city. Uh, and this often leads to the exclusion of a wealth of urban experiences uh, across time and space. And, and so I think that instead, when we focus on disorder, we're able to bring uh, out a sense of universality uh, that is much more inclusive of this set of diverse uh, experiences. Uh, the third and last thing that I want to do uh, today is to offer some examples then of how we can investigate disorder across cities and time that brings out the, the wealth uh, of experiences in hopefully in the way that uh, we can better prefigure possible urban futures and how we think uh, about them. So, so let's, let's start with the, the first thing about why disorder. Uh, we have spent a good deal of ink in urban studies, uh, and probably a lot of money as well in research, uh, discussing and demonstrating how order has been used and misused um, as a policy imperative often to discipline, to segregate, to exclude the undesirable others um, from public spaces, um, we had the, the presentation today uh, in the morning uh, by Monique, um, also in the panel here earlier today, issues around uh, gender and many other uh, aspects around uh, class, income and, and the like. So we know enough about how the impetus for ordering uh, space can be delivered through very direct physical interventions <coughs> in the uh, urban fabric ranging from you know, the very innocuous uh, marking of a parking bay to the very much more hostile anti-homeless spikes that exist in some, um, seems to be going around uh, London quite, quite a bit and other cities as well. So we also know how planning rules and regulations have a particular imagination of order embedded in them. So, and in this case, uh, Susan just asked us about the reverse, whether they can have different imaginations of order. Um, and these imaginations of order are often enacted in the name of uh, health and safety and other different aspects. So uh, an example being how planning rules and regulations determine whether someone's home uh, is deemed formal or informal housing uh, with the attending consequences that comes with that uh, uh, distinction. So we also know about the many disciplining institutional practices uh, that are enacted, say, in the name of security or even sovereignty, uh, uh, that seek to maintain an orderly existence, uh, 
uh, within the imagined territories of the, of the nation state. Um, you just have to walk along the cities of Oxford uh, and you lose count of how many CCTV cameras uh, there are controlling every uh, single one of your movements. Um, and if you are visiting Philadelphia, I don't know if there's anyone from the US in this room, um, you might as well be prepared for the possibility uh, that police might arrest you for loitering at your nearby Starbucks, um, especially if your skin uh, happens to be of a certain darker color as it happened just a few days ago where two black men were arrested uh, just for waiting for uh, one of uh, their friends. So yet, despite all of these many efforts for ordering our lives in the places we live in, um, this order persists. Um, as a result, it seems to me a bit illogical to entertain the question um, that uh, the uh, conference organizers posed to, this, uh, to members of this panel. Um, the question was, what are the reasonable limits or expectations for order in a city? And I, I mean, I'm not trying to put them on the spot, I think it's a valid question, but it seems to me that it's much more productive to ask instead, um, what are the reasonable limits of this order that we can live with? Um, and if this is the case, if this is a much more productive question, my other question is, why aren't we asking that question ourselves um, empirically uh, as well? What is it about order that is so compelling as a normative uh, value uh, that we feel like we need to place our attention on order instead of uh, disorder. So I would like to suggest that a possible reason for this predilection for order is that um, as a normative value, uh, order equates with a notion of universal principles that is very amenable, and amenable to government and control and hence uh, of analytical interest to many scholars in urban studies. Um, so let us explore what kind of notion of universal principle this is. And, and to help this out, I'm going to uh, draw here on the work of geographer um, Clive Barnett in his latest book, The Priority of Injustice. And I can't, I can't do justice to his book and his argument here and to the wealth of readings that uh, authors that he engaged from critical theorists to anthropologists so um, I will I'm going to be very opportunistic and just share with you um, a distinction that Barnett uh, draws between two notions of what universal means when examining concepts of justice so um, you would say that on the one hand we can say that a principle of justice is universal if it can be applied in the same manner anywhere, all the time, by anybody. Uh, and he calls this impartial uh, universalism. Uh, for impartiality is the underlying quality of um, what makes the principle uh, acceptable. On the other hand, we will say, we can say that a principle of justice is universal if it is inclusive of the universe of possibilities and of experiences and meanings uh, of justice. And he calls this the inclusive urbanism, uh, given that inclusion is then the underlying feature of, um, uh, that makes the principle uh, uh, appropriate. Barnett argues that when we think about principles of justice through the lens of impartial uh, universalism, we tend to think of injustice as the absence of justice, uh, not as an experience in itself. And this is because the notion of impartiality implies that there must be a single predetermined ontologically defined notion of what counts as justice, and this is only possible through uh, uh, an homogenization of experiences into a starting conception uh, uh, of justice. This in turn makes the administration of justice a rather straightforward affair, and I, I, I would argue, and one that is uh, more easily governed from near and from uh, afar. 
However, uh, Barnett would argue, impartial universalism is not helpful to evaluate the diversity of situations that are left outside uh, of that standard conception of justice, not least because they are treated as oddities, abnormalities, or lesser versions of uh, the ideal uh, of justice. Uh, and so, if we are to, uh, in, in his view, what we then should uh, focus is actually on, uh, not on the ideal, uh, abstract ideal of justice, but on the experiences of justice. And he, he, he makes quite an argument for uh, looking at those um, uh, experiences of uh, injustice uh, ethnographically um, um, in many different ways. So by the same token, uh, we can say that the persistent future feature of our urban lives is disorder. Uh, and order is the abstract uh, ideal, the ideal orderly city determined through a notion of impartial uh, uh, universalism. So if we take a cue from him and his pre preference for inclusive universalism, we may be better served by focusing on the everyday uh, experiences of uh, disorder instead of uh, thinking about uh, uh, what order might be and how might we characterize it, and then understand the reasonable limits of disorder that we can live with in different places at different times. So, all right, before you all really, really just tune out, let me then move on to the final thing I wanted to do today, uh, and that was to offer some examples of how we can investigate disorder across cities. Um, and, and for this, I would propose that we think about disorder as uh, two different ways in which uh, things in cities can be out of order. Uh, the first way in which things can be out of order are very familiar to infrastructures, a topic that I've been working on for a few years now. And obviously when infrastructures are working fine, we don't really pay attention to them. Uh, it's only when uh, uh, they get into this repair, when they get out of order, uh, that they become matters of concern. Uh, yet in places like Mozambique, where I've been doing my, uh, my field work, infrastructure seems to be intermittently in and out of order. Uh, uh, service and provision, uh, that sort of ideal order that we have in mind, are not necessarily forgotten or forsaken by individual people. People do still desire very much and hope that they will be provided with water and electricity on a continuous uh, basis. Yet their lived experience is much more pragmatic uh, in many ways. For lack of better options, they have to engage uh, with alternative infrastructures uh, and different forms of co-produced infrastructures and <coughs> arrangements that help them cope with life out of order uh, uh, when that happens to infrastructure. So what this means in terms of urban futures is that we may be better off uh, taking on those alternative arrangements as possible approaches to how we plan and deliver access to um, urban infrastructures instead of normatively assessing these as uh, uh, lesser versions of the modern infrastructural ideal um, and discarding them as undesirable. The second way uh, in which things can be out of order, which are my last example, relates to when things or people or activity, activities seem to be out of place. Uh, and we may include here in this category the undesirable others that I had men uh, mentioned earlier on. Uh, I don't know, the homeless, hawkers and street vendors, uh, the migrants, but we may also include other types of undesirables, like, uh, not that I think they are undesirable, but protesters, the car park that is parked in a double line, um, or uh, houses that are painted in odd colors, or uh, this is where I wanted to have uh, the slide, uh, a house here in Oxford that has a shark plunged onto its roof. I totally recommend that you go and check it out because it's, I find it really cool. But, um, some of us will find some of these four forms of disorder unacceptable, while others won't mind them at all and may in fact welcome them as adding color or richness to our urban lives. 
so it seems to me that the question of how much of this disorder uh, can we live with uh, can only really be productively addressed in inclusive terms by developing a shared sense of how we want to live together. Our urban futures cannot be predetermined or predefined. They will always be a relational, if precarious, achievement that we must continuously work on. So, to conclude 30 seconds, I hope I have been able to at least provide answers to the two, two questions that had animated this particular panel. First, uh, inclusive universalism may be a more productive way forward for thinking about urban uh, values in normative but non homogenizing ways. Um, and second, as a consequence, we may be best uh, structure future urban transformations by thinking not about order, but by focusing on collectively deciding on the reasonable limits of the disorder we can live with. As mentioned before, this will always be a precarious achievement, or perhaps in other words, the orderly city we strive for can only remain an open-ended uh, project. Thank you.